It's day three of Murders at Karlov Manor spoilers, and today we get what might be the most competitive banner monicon yet, and a bunch more, so let's break it down. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Ephrata Live, and it's time for another daily dose of Murders at Karlov Manor spoilers, and we have a ton of sweet stuff to talk about today, which means we should probably jump right into it, start talking spicy new magic cards. Before we do, a couple of quick reminders. First, if you need any of these cards, you can snag them from our sponsor, Card Kingdom, over at cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. Second, to keep up on all the latest spoilers throughout the day, you should mosey on over to mtdpreviews.com. Anyway, let's talk Murders at Karlov Manor. First up today, we got a blue mythic that I currently think is kind of being misunderstood and underrated in Intrude on the Mind. So Intrude on the Mind, five mana instant. It says reveal the top five cards of your library and you separate them into two piles. An opponent chooses one of those piles, put that pile in your hand, and then the other into your graveyard. Create a zero zero colorless thopter artifact creature token with flying, then put a plus one plus one counter on it for each card put in your graveyard this way. So let's think about how this card actually works. You cast it for five mana, probably during your opponent's turn at instant speed. What are your options here? So the extreme option is you put five cards in one pile, zero cards in the other pile, and your opponent's going to get to choose. Do I give you a five, five flyer or do I give you five cards? The middle of the road option is going to be a three, two split. Most likely three cards in one pile, two cards in the other pile. Your opponent's going to get to choose. Okay. Do I give you two cards in a three, three? Do I give you three cards in a two, two? There's a little more gamemanship to it. Like where do you put your best card? Does your opponent try to deny you your best card? I honestly think the most common split with this is probably going to be four and one with your best card as the one and the other four cards of the four. And then you're either going to get essentially a four, four flying flash creature. That's like a super anticipate. You get the best card of your top five, or you get like a super mall drifter, a one, one flyer. That's going to draw you four cards at instant speed. None of them are going to be your best card, but still it's 2024. Are you really Really playing bad cards in your deck. I guess the nightmare is you hit like four lands in one spell or something, but outside of those scenarios, I think this card's always going to generate value. So what I've seen with this card so far is a lot of people just jump to factor fiction and it makes a lot of sense, right? This is a reverse factor fiction. We've seen some reverse factor fictions in the past, like steam auguries, literally reverse factor fiction very, very bad when you're the one separating the piles and then your opponent's the one choosing what cards you get. It kind of guarantees you're mostly never going to get your best cards, which is what makes reverse factor fiction so bad. But this isn't a factor fiction. I think this comparison is actually greatly hurting this card. This is actually like a weird flash punisher mold drifter. And my guess is the way this card is going to play is you're going to see a lot of four one splits. I talked about that before. I think that's kind of the, the default mode I would expect for this card and both of those options are pretty good right like so what i'm envisioning is your opponent goes and they attack you with a tenacious underdog or blood tithe harvester you're some sort of control deck that's leaving up your man anyway for counter spells and removal so you just cast this and you go four one your opponent either chooses okay i give you a four four flyer that's gonna eat my attacker and you get probably the best card if you split your pile properly or i give you a one one flyer my creature gets to live but you're gonna get to draw your next four cards probably not the best one but your next four cards which either way is an absurd amount of value for five mana and instant speed especially in a deck that's already interested in leaving up mana during their opponent's turn to leave up other instant speed effects so i actually think this card is very much not factor fiction it's a flash flyer punisher card that reads a little bit like factor fiction but if you think about it as a mold drifter rather than a factor fiction i think the card gets much much better and is much more exciting also worth mentioning this is another sneaky way to generate card advantage in standard without getting wrecked by shieldred this is essentially a draw four potentially but no shieldred triggers we see this with memory deluge right where part of the upside of memory deluge is you're drawing cards but you're not getting killed by shieldred there's also some additional 
upside here. So where do you play this card? And as I mentioned before, I think the most common homes are going to be controlled XX that already want to leave up mana on their opponent's turn. So it works really well with Chrome Host Seed Shark. Like not only do you get whatever creature you get from Intrude the Mind, but you're going to get a big incubate token as well from the Chrome Host Seed Shark. It's possible this was intended to be a replacement for Memory Deluge, which would have rotated under the old schedule where this kind of does something similar, right? You'll leave up your mana in your control deck if you don't need to do anything else and to turn you can flash this in draw some cards make a creature also kind of sneaky with up the beanstalk i almost wonder if it could show up in some sort of like maybe the domain decks or some sort of ramp deck where this does trigger up the beanstalk it generates card advantage it digs through your deck you also get some additional upside if you just care about filling your graveyard because remember uh, the cards that don't go to your hand are gonna go to your graveyard so if you're trying to like collect evidence or reanimate stuff or grow your herborg lure waves this is gonna help there as well so intrude on the mind I'm going to pick this as my right now sleeper for this set. I actually think this card is actually going to be really good. And I've seen a lot of people pretty down on it because of the comparison to like Steam Augury, a bad factor fiction. But I don't think that's what this is. I think this is actually a really powerful threat for decks that want to play at instant speed, generating card advantage and adding a body to the battlefield. We also got yet another Panermonicon. I know some of you are probably getting sick of a Panermonicon every set. I'm not getting sick of it because I love me some Panharmonicons in Delaney Streetwise Lookout. And this might actually be the most competitive Panharmonicon yet. I know Elish Dorn really good, but this might actually be better in a lot of decks, especially for competitive play. So 3 mana 2-2 two, two Legendary Human Scout says creatures you control with power 2 or less can't be blocked by creatures with power 3 or greater. Uh, so this lets your weenies get in through big blockers. Also worth mentioning, it synergizes with the new morph mechanics because anything you're morphing is a face down 2-2. Two, two so all your morphs can swing through big blockers. The exciting part, though, is if an ability of a creature you control with power two or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. So uh, that text is essentially a new Panharmonicon. It's literally Panharmonicon, Elish Dorn, all that stuff. Of course, there's a restriction here. It only works with creatures power two or less, which you might think is a problem, but in all honesty, I don't think it is because most of the things you're playing with a Panharmonicon anyway are creatures with powerful ETB triggers in low power. So if you think about standard, what am I playing with my Elish Norns? I'm playing Spirited Companions, Ambitious Farmhands, Lorna the Third Pass, Brutal Cathars, effects like that. Delaney triggers on all those anyway. So this is kind of an Elish Norn that is only three mana, which is a huge, huge deal. Like that lower cost makes this so much easier to put in decks. And then it also solves one of Panharmonicon decks problems, which is they tend to be really dirtily, but not good at closing out the game because you're playing all these low power, high ETB triggered creatures. Uh, but with Delaney out, you can chip in for some damage with your Spirited Companions and Ambitious Farmhands and maybe actually kill your opponent and not just generate a huge pile full of value. Also worth mentioning, why we focus so far on ETB triggers, also worth mentioning, why so far we focus mostly on ETB triggers, Delaney works with any creature with power two or less, with any trigger. So this is probably good in soul sisters your soul war and soul attendant gonna trigger twice instead of just once for twice as much life gain twice as big of a johnny pride mate or whatever it works with vron and blood artists these slow power creatures they have a trigger when something dies so your blood artist is gonna trigger twice your vron I believe actually triggers twice because of a Panharmonicon because it doubles it up even though it can only trigger once per, uh, per turn. But if I'm wrong, correct me in the comments. It works with Rafine. Like Rafine double conniving is like kind of absurd uh, because Rafine's already absurd. And doing it twice is even better. So there's actually a lot of flexibility to this card. The other thing I want to mention is this is actually like super, super cute with disguise and with any face down creatures, with cloak creatures. So I mentioned before, you're going to make them all unblockable, right? So that's already nice. They're unblockable by big creatures, creatures that can actually just kill them in combat. So that's already nice. The other trick is, though, with our new Mega Mega Morph effects, uh, Disguise and with Cloak, the face down creature has Ward 2, and Ward is a triggered ability. So let's say you have a face down unyielding gatekeeper, or maybe you cloak something with a Trotta. Your face down creature has Ward 2. Ward is a triggered ability, which means if you have Delaney out, you actually have Ward 4. I guess technically it's Ward 2 twice. But 
where your opponent, if they want to cut down or play with fire your creature, they're going to have to spend five mana for the double ward two, four total cost, which makes this kind of ridiculous protection in a disguise deck. Also excited to play this in Soul Herder. I've been messing around with Soul Herder and Timeless. And again, just like I was talking about in Standard, most of the creatures I have in that deck are going to have less than two power anyway. Like, there's not really much of a drawback here. This is actually just like a Panharmonicon, but it's less mana and it does more things. If you're playing mostly Maldrifters and Wall of Omens or whatever anyway, there's just no drawback. So great in a Soul Herder deck. I think this is also like the ultimate Richard Commander card. If you ever watch where Richard on Commander Clash, he's such a big believer in his Spirited Companions and Knight of the White Orchids and Pilgrim's Eye, these little just dorky value generating creatures that put you on the board early, give you something to just uh, uh, soak up an initial attack, discourage that person that just wants to like trigger their sword from attacking you because you can jump block with your random horrible creature. Delaney fits perfectly in that strategy. And it also seems like a great 99 card. You can definitely build this as like a weenie panharmonicon deck with Delaney as your commander, but it might be even better in the 99 because there's a lot of commanders that have power two or less in really strong triggered abilities. So like Sram or Sethus, you're going to double draw. Kemble's going to double trigger. Prague gonna double blink, Zer is gonna double tutor, uh, Chu Lane gonna draw tons of cards, Alayla gonna flood the board with tokens, Preston, I don't even want to think about what's gonna happen if you have this with a Preston and a bunch of blink effects going on, so there's actually a ton of homes for this card, so we think Delaney, I know it's a Panharmonicon, I know maybe that's lost some of its luster because we get them so much, but I actually think this card is super legit, and I would not be at all surprised to see this card have an impact on Standard, be very good in Commander, and maybe, maybe, maybe even have a chance in like Pioneer or Historic where you can find this with Collected Company. So all around, I think Delaney is pretty legit. We also got Unyielding Gatekeeper, and this card, ah, oh, I really love it. But I'm also on the fence at just how playable it's going to be. So a 2 mana 3-2 Elephant Cleric. It has Disguise of 2. So you can cast it face down for 3 as a 2-2 two, two Ward 2. Flip it up for 2 mana. When it's flipped face up, you can exile another target non-land permanent. If you controlled it, return it to the battlefield tap. So you can blink your own thing. And it's any non-land permanent. So you can blink a Saga to reset it or whatever. A Planeswalker for some reason. Or if it's not your thing... It's Controller creates a 2-2 white and blue detective creature token. So this card, it kind of looks like a weird Werefox bodyguard or Brutal Cathar. We have a lot of these uh, exile something creatures in standard right now. But it's not really. If you look at Werefox Bodyguard or Brutal Cathar, they have one huge drawback, which is when they die, your opponent gets the thing back. So they're very temporary removal. Unyielding Gatekeeper, it's really more of Skyclave Apparition, which is proven to be the best version of these ETB Exile effects because you're getting rid of the thing forever. So Skyclave, you exile something, mana value four or less. When it dies, its controller gets an illusion token of its mana value. Unyielding Gatekeeper is arguably even better than Skyclave. It's worse in the sense that it's more expensive. You get to play it face down, flip it face up, all that stuff. But you can get rid of literally any non-land permanent. No mana value restriction. And your opponent will never get that back. All they get is a random 2-2, which is actually smaller than the Skyclave Apparition token a lot of times. Plus, you get the upside that it can be an ephemera. If you're a Blink deck, which is probably going to be the best home for this, or maybe you're a Panharmonicon deck, this is a way you can Blink one of your own things, save it from removal, uh, maybe reuse its ETB trigger. And the fact that it hits any non-land permanent kind of makes it like a fair Felidair Guardian. You're never going to get the infiniteness of Felidair Guardian because you got to flip up Unyielding Gatekeeper to get its ability, but being able to flip anything, like I mentioned before, means you can reset a Saga back to its first counters. If you get a Planeswalker low on loyalty, you're able to reset its loyalty. You can blink a Portal to Phyrexia to Wrath the Board again. There's a lot of flexibility here. So there was actually a deck in Modern, we've played it before, it's on the channel, it was a budget magic deck, that looked to morph in a chroma angel of fury and then ephemerate it so the trick here is you play the morph as a face down creature for three mana and then ephemerate when you blink it it's going to flip it face up so it's a way you can get an chroma at a really really big discount unyielding gatekeeper can kind of bring this play pattern to standard in some sort of disguise deck let's say you're playing a uh, new vanifar which we'll talk more about in a minute which lets you cloak a card from your hand so you can cloak a card putting it into play as a face down 2-2 creature like cityscape leveler let's say 
are a portal to Phyrexia. And then Unyielding Gatekeeper can flip it face up. And then all of a sudden you have this massive, super expensive threat on the battlefield for a huge, huge discount. So that's one of my favorite plays for this. My question for this card, and my question really for the disguise mechanic in general, is, is it going to be good enough? in 2024 so last time we had this mechanic in standard we're going back to like cons of tarkir era which is 2015 so almost a decade ago and we did see some more threats see you play like den protector you play it face down you mega morph it up into a three two and you get to eternal witness a card back from your graveyard or jeering instigator you flip it face up to threaten something to land a turn so we have seen these cards see play a decade ago my question is in 2024 magic where cards are so powerful and snowball-y from a competitive perspective I'm talking about like playing a competitive standard deck or pioneer deck can we actually morph things can we afford to pay three mana to play an unyielding gatekeeper face down and then two more mana to flip it face up with our end result being a three two with some sweet value from its unmorph trigger or flip face up trigger but still that seems kind of slow we're in a standard where for three mana you could just be slamming preacher of schism and snowballing or gix in snowballing or Gothic and killing your opponent, or Rafine and snowballing, or Graveyard Trespasser, which is really hard to kill. Is it going to be correct to like play this underpowered, even with Ward 2? It's still an underpowered 3 mana 2 2 for hopes that we can flip it up in the future for value. Or is it going to be better just to like slam a good card that doesn't require any additional value, any additional flipping, any additional time to actually get the value out of it? I'm curious what you think. That's the one place that I'm skeptical about this card is like, is the mechanic disguise in general strong enough for the speed of 2024 magic? If this card does show up, as I mentioned before, excited to play this in Panormonicon decks. I'm excited to try the like super janky Acroma flip strategy in standard with this card, trying to cheat the cityscape leveler into play or whatever. Also seems pretty good in a disguise deck. If you're playing additional rewards for flipping things face up, like Pyrotechnic Performer, then this gets even better. So we'll have to see how many payoffs we get just for playing face down creatures, but that would increase it in value a lot. So I think... I'm not sure you can just play this in a generic deck. The way you do Skyclave Apparition, just because it's five total mana to play it face down and then flip it face up, but in the right deck where you are hopefully able to get value out of blinking your own thing, and you can use this as a pretty powerful, not very conditional removal spell on your opponent's thing, that's where I think Unyielding Gatekeeper probably gets a chance to shine. Speaking of Vanifar, we also got to do Vanifar in Vanifar Evolved Enigma. So four mana three four simic legendary elf ooze wizard so at the beginning of combat on your turn choose one cloak card from your hand so put it into play face down is a two two creature with ward two can flip it up any time for paying its mana cost if it's a creature card or put a plus one plus one counter on each colorless creature you control so vanifar this card's pretty interesting so if you play this absolutely fairly it's a four mana three four that is going to give you a warded 2-2 two, two for free every turn. So technically the turn you play this, assuming it makes it to combat, which it should, you're going to get a 3-4 and a 2-2. Two, two, so that's what? Five total power, six total toughness with some upside there. And every turn it sticks out, you can do this again. This is assuming you have a card in your hand that you want to cloak. So there is a bit of a cost to that. You never have to cloak anything. You can always just choose to put counters on stuff, even if you don't have creatures, uh, just to not have to cloak something. But you do need to have extra cards in your hand for this to work. Work. I'm not sure that's quite good enough. I do like that it makes two bodies right away. What I'm excited about with this card, though, is it has some super sneaky, weird combo potential. So if you think about what this is, it's essentially a scroll of fates. This artifact that just taps to manifest a card from your hand. Cloaking's basically just upgraded version of manifesting. You get the ward on top of it. And kind of like a steal over here. I couldn't find anything that was exactly put a plus one, plus one counter on each colorless creature you control. Steal Overs here, pretty close, only artifact creatures, but close enough. So those are two pretty powerful effects. I think the intriguing part, though, is this Scroll of Fates ability. We have seen Scroll of Fates actually see some legacy play in some janky decks, thanks to some combo potential. So how do you go off with Manifar? And I'll say this is probably mostly commander stuff, although I'm excited to try this in standard. I'm not expecting it to be like super busted, but I am excited to give it a shot. So combo number one, 
manifest or I guess cloak now something big from your hand face down and then use a blink effect to flip it up so you put a Ulamog the infinite guy or into play for free but it's a face down 2-2 but then you toss a deep dwelling blink it it's going to come back into play face up you get a Ulamog for essentially free instead of 11 mana or you can do fairy time twist it and this works with any type of permanent so you can like cloak an omniscience flip it face up using it to fairy's time twist or a thassa deep dweller to blink it and then you got an omniscience and you're probably going to win the game so i think that's direction number one to go building around this card there's also an incredibly janky infinite combo which i think might make worm fang manta into a good card in commander for the first time ever so worm fang manta one of the worst creatures that has ever been printed it's a seven mana six one flyer that it says when it comes into play you skip your next turn but when it leaves play you get an extra turn so the idea is you play it you skip a turn but then eventually you're going to get that turn back once it dies uh, with vanifar though in a way to repeatedly bounce worm fang mana which there are many of but let's say crystal shard might be the best of them you can actually pretty easily take infinite turns so what you have to do you need a bunch of mana but you have your vanifar probably as your commander so you start with one free combo piece you go to combat on your turn you cloak the worm fang manta during your post combat main phase you flip it up so that's seven mana you pay one mana for crystal shard to bounce it back to your hand that's going to trigger its leave play ability so you get an extra turn then during your extra turn you can cloak the worm fang mana flip it face up crystal shard bounce it take an extra turn essentially unless your opponent can interact with this at instant speed you just get infinite turns in the jankiest way imaginable there's also been some legacy decks i mentioned that use scroll of fate and these are usually focused on trying to manifest or now cloak something that is really low mana cost and really powerful but with a big drawback so the classic example is Frexian dreadnought Frexian dreadnought is a one mana 12 12 trampler absurd obviously the problem is when it enters a battlefield you have to sacrifice 12 total power of creatures or you gotta sack the dreadnought well vanifar gets around this if you have vanifar you can cloak the dreadnought you can flip it face up for its mana value which is only one but since the cloak card was already on the battlefield you avoid the negative etb trigger so you essentially just get a one mana 12 12 trampler which is kind of ridiculous also works well with like the haunted creatures anything that's like really big and low mana cost but has a super negative ETB to balance itself out. So that's another fun way to build around Vanifar. So Vanifar, I'm actually pretty excited about this card. I'm definitely going to try building it in standard. I don't know how good it's going to be in standard, but I love the idea of like cloaking something huge and then blinking. I love that Akruma deck that we played in modern, and I'm excited to try to do that in standard. But really, I think at a minimum, Vanifar is going to be a really unique and super fun commander card to build around. We also got a super cute little aggro enchantment in Connect the Dots. So Connect the Dots, two mana red enchantment, says when a creature you control attacks, exile the top card of your library face down, which means you can't look at it in case you were wondering what face down means. Thank you for the clarification, Watsi. And then you could pay two mana, discard your hand, sacrifice it, and put all the cards exiled with it into their owner's hands. So connect the dots. This card, if you can go super wide, can actually be a pretty absurd source of card advantage. So it's kind of like being a bonded courier for your entire team. That's probably the closest comparison. The key here is it triggers whenever a creature attacks. So if you have five creatures, you can be exiling five cards each turn when they attack to connect the dots. So in some sort of go wide deck, this can generate a truly absurd amount of card advantage. So the first thing I thought of is the Regal Bunny corn gleeful demolition boros aggro deck that deck is really good at putting these mostly underpowered one ones into play like gleeful demolition can be putting three one ones into play on turn one you drop connect the dots this is a way to refuel once you quickly dump your hand which happens all the time in the aggro deck so i really want to give it a try there on the other hand could this work in something like mono red that's where i get a little more skeptical so uh, the bunny corn deck just really good at going super wide with creatures connect the dots super powerful mono red they are playing creatures consistently, but you're usually playing a creature, 
maybe two creatures a turn, you run out of cards. Is it going to be worth playing Connect the Dots in a deck like that? Is it going to be worth taking off turn two to get this on the battlefield? Or is that just going to be too slow for Mono Red? I think he has a chance for Mono Red, but I think it's more likely to be a sideboard card that you bring in in the slower grindier matchups to fight through your opponent's sweepers and removal rather than a main deck card. Also could be really good in just a dedicated token deck. I know we talk about making tokens work like literally every set and then they never work no matter what they add to the format but we still have like Jetmir and Ginny Faye which really want you to go super wide as for commander I think the same thing mostly holds true you want to be some sort of super go wide style deck maybe like Burdeclad or Perforos goes really wide Nyali actually might be the best tome it wants you to make a ton of tokens and go super wide to draw cards with your commander this is kind of a nice backup effect so I think there's specific decks in commander that might want it but I think in most decks there's probably more consistent sources of card advantage so I think this is actually designed more to be a 60 card format card than a commander staple we also got <laughs> One of the wonkiest cards we've seen from the set so far, the Pride of Holclad. So the Pride of Holclad is an 11 mana, 10 and a greed, legendary crocodile elk turtle. It's a 215. <laughs> It costs X less to cast, where X is the total toughness of creatures you control. It has Defender, then you can pay 4 mana, including 2 blue mana. And until end of turn, target creature you control gets plus 1, plus 0. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw cards equal to its toughness. And it can attack as though it didn't have Defender. So this card... I don't know what to make of this card. It's a card I'm excited to build around because it's like super weird and unique. But is this card actually good? So in standard, we do have a few cards that kind of encourage you to play high toughness creatures. Bedrock Tortoise, for example, giving your creatures the ability to deal damage equal to their toughness rather than their power. If you have Bedrock Tortoise and then you get down your Pride of the Hulk clad, you can activate Pride of the Hulk clad's ability on itself. And if you actually get in the attack, you're going to hit your opponent for 15 and draw 15 cards, which is kind of wild. Ancient Lumbernaut, kind of a bad backup Bedrock Turtis. Catapult Fodder also cares about high toughness creatures. So you can see some sort of like toughness matters stack here, which can turbo out Pride of the Hulk Lad. Like any two of these high toughness creatures is going to get Pride of the Hulk Lad down to like a couple of mana. When this is a one mana 215, it's actually kind of hilarious, at least on defense. No one's ever getting through that. It also works with the Ancient one awkwardly. I don't know if this is even good, but if you play turn two ancient one, you have an eight toughness creature. That means on turn three, your Pride of the Hulk lad's going to cost three mana. So you can just get it down. Is curving like whatever on turn one into ancient one on turn two into Pride of the Hulk lad on turn three. Is that enough? Is that enough to actually make a real deck? It also synergizes with Ancient One's activated ability. If you discard it, you're going to mill for 11 because it has a ridiculously high mana value. So there are ways to get this on the battlefield super quickly. I don't know if this is really designed to be a standard card, though. I think where this will really shine is in Toughness Matters Commander decks, like Arcades the Strategist. In Arcades, you're playing all these defensive creatures anyway, so it's going to naturally fit there. You're going to have tons of high toughness creatures. Arcades is going to let you attack with everything without even activating the Pride of the Hulk Lad's ability. And then what Pride of the Hulk Lad really wants is evasion. So the biggest problem with Pride of the Hulk Lad, you do all this work, you play these high toughness creatures, you get it on the battlefield, you activate its ability for four mana, you still got to actually get in the attack and hit your opponent to draw the cards. But if you have something like Tisiku Yumazawa, which makes it so creatures you control with power or toughness of one can't be blocked, you can activate Pride on a zero power high toughness creature. Uh, it'll be unblocked thanks to Tetsuko, hit your opponent, draw a ton of cards, and hopefully snowball that to victory, which kind of lets you, like, build your own Last March of the Ents. Like, Last March of the Ents, I know, you get to put a bunch of things into play, which makes it kind of busted, but even just the card advantage of Last March of the Ents is pretty wild, right? Drawing equal to the greatest toughness among creatures you control. If you can actually get in attacks with whatever creature you activate Pride of the Hulk Lad's ability on, you can be doing this every single turn. So, Unblock ability, access tunnel, whatever, gonna be super, super key. The other way you can do this, of course, is if you do have something like Arcades that just lets your defenders attack, uh, even though they have defender, then you can just swing with a bunch of defenders, wait and see how your opponent blocks, and then activate on the unblocked creature to be able to draw the card. So I think Pride of the Hulk Clad in those Toughness Manor decks are gonna be really good. As far as being your commander, 
you can build around it. You definitely can, although some of the support's missing. So the biggest challenge for Pyta the Hulk lad is really twofold. What do you want out of this commander? You want to deal damage equal to toughness rather than power. That is probably the biggest thing. And then you need your defenders to be able to attack. Uh, you can do it with pride's ability, but four mana, you can't really do that too often. It's just too much mana. You can't make a whole board full of creatures attack. So the key card is going to be assault formation. That's like the one card that kind of does everything pride of the Hulk lad wants but a lot of the backups of this effect letting your defenders attack dealing damage equal to toughness rather than power just aren't in pride's colors they tend to have white in their mana cost which is going to make it a little tricky i think to build around in commander it might actually be better to not play defenders if that makes sense uh, the ability of pride of the Hulk lad it works with non-defender creatures you can still attack with your aegeus turtle or dragon's eye savants and still draw a bunch of cards after you activate the ability so it might actually be at its best with non-defender high toughness creatures because then you don't have to worry so much about finding your one assault formation or having four mana repeatedly to activate pride of the whole clad to attack with your defenders so pride of the whole clad the card's super cool. It's I, like, I'm gonna build a deck around this card. I'm excited for this card. I'm imagining it's probably like a meme card rather than a broken card, but that doesn't matter because it's just super funny. And when it goes off, it's gonna do some pretty powerful things. Finally, in the realm of lower rarity cards, I wanna complain just a little bit about your Bane Orangutan. Uh, the card's actually good, right? Three mana, two, two. It's an ape. When it ATBs, either blow up an artifact or sack an artifact and put two counters on it. So depending on the situation in the deck, this is either like a bad Rex Age that doesn't hit enchantments because it's a red card, obviously, or a three mana four four, which is pretty good stats, especially for a common. The thing I want to complain about, though is the sneaky reach. My goodness, this does not look like a card that should have reach. I know it's like literally reaching in the air, but big monkeys in magic don't traditionally have reach. Red cards don't have that much reach. I just know at pre-release or drafting on arena, this is gonna be the card that I swing my big flyer into thinking I have lethal, only to get blocked by this orangutan, which for some reason has reach and then die in the backswing. So when you go to pre-release, keep an eye out for the orangutan because that sneaky reach it will get you we also got a detective lord in private eye uh three minutes three three is zorius homunculus detective pumps your other detectives plus one plus one and when you draw your second card for each turn target detective can't be blocked this turn not sure if this will really matter do we actually have enough detectives to build a tribal detective deck Eh, probably not, considering that this is literally the first set that Detectives has ever existed in Magic. But worth keeping in mind, could be a fun casual card. We also got Forensic Researcher, which is worth mentioning for one specific reason. So it's a three mana one three Merfolk Detective. You can tap it to untap another target permanent you control, and then you can also tap it and collect evidence three to tap a creature you don't control. The reason this card is notable is it allows for a new infinite combo in standard with Deep Root Pilgrimage. So Deep Root Pilgrimage, whenever one or more non-token merfolk you control become tapped, you make a 1-1 one, one blue Hexproof Moofrolk creature. So if you can get two forensic researchers on the battlefield, either naturally or you can play one and then clone one, you'll be able to use them to tap and untap each other. So you tap one, don't tap the other one, tap the first one, untap the second one, back and forth, back and forth. Every time you do this, you're gonna make a Hexproof Merfolk. So essentially you just get to make infinite merfolk tokens and they all have hex proof just how good this is uh, it's probably more of an against the odds deck than a competitive thing you do need two of the forensic researchers and really it's a three card combo right you need pilgrimage and then two additional cards so i don't think this is like splinter twin gonna break the format but it might be a boost of power for merfolk in standard or at worst a fun against the odds deck otherwise a bunch more draft chaff chaff. You can check it out over at mtgpreviews.com. Anyway, that brings us to the end of our daily murders at Garlove Manor spoilers for today. So like usual, let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back tomorrow with even more murders at Garlove Manor spoilers. So until then, have an amazing day. And I will talk to you soon. Looking for even more magic? Well, you can find yesterday's spoiler video here, or maybe check out the video where we talked about the best spell from every year Magic the Gathering.